Hello, everyone. <laughs> Next is beer time, so I'll do my best to catch your attention until then. So, okay, it works. So, uh, my name is Laura Gleber, and I, I'm a game user researcher associate, and I work at Ubisoft Paris. I'm part of the virtual reality research and development team. And so far, I've led places on three different projects, Eagle Fight, We're Wolves Within, and I've worked on the HTC Vive prototypes, which I cannot talk about yet. So, so far, a lot of work has already been done in the art, actually more than 20 years of work. But for us in the video games industry, I believe that this is some kind of new era, um, some kind of new era for VR for us, and we have a role to play in this era. So I've chosen main point of interest when one uh, wants to run VR tests. So first, as it is something new for us, we need a new uh, grammar uh, for interaction um, designs. And we also need to highlight intuitiveness in, the, in design and the major importance of cognitive process. And I will highlight this with a study case of Eagle Flight. Um, cyber sickness is a thing. Cyber sickness and comfort of play is a main concern in, the, in uh, VR. So we will talk about this. And I'll show you tools to monitor cyber sickness. And to end the presentation, I want to share best practices with, with, with you. Uh, built on our experience so far on different VR tests. So let's talk about interactions and how to build a new uh, grammar with two well-known um, concepts. So new devices imply new kind of interactions. Um, we must bear in mind something, is that um, when people come to play test, to play test VR, Uh, so far, not many have already tested VR, um, or maybe five or ten minutes during a convention. So this is a main question to, to, to see how they will approach the virtual world, how they will try to interact for the first time in VR with the elements of the virtual world. So to answer these questions, we need to build a new grammar. Why? Because You cannot just take a non-VR game design and transpose it into VR and expect the things to work. It doesn't. It doesn't work. So we need to build new interactions and, as a matter of fact, a new grammar. We concluded, uh, based on the work uh, with early development dash to survive uh, games, that two uh, well-known principles such as conventions and affordances could help us. Uh, with this. So why conventions? Because people have habits. When they try to interact with something new, and this is new for most of the players, they will try to transpose years of gaming experience, years of experience and habits with the technology they use every day to what is new for them. So as a matter of fact, they are uh, controllers. So let's take a concrete example because I find it very exciting that new conventions are already emerging in VR. So maybe some of you uh, know about the teleportation system. So the point of teleportation system is VR is that with your controller you can aim at a precise location and you can click and it will teleport you from the point you are standing to the point you are uh, to the location you are pointing at. And if you look closely at the design, there is nothing intuitive in this kind of design. There is nothing self-explicit. They even had to label it in full nation to explain that if you do that, then you will uh, trigger the action of teleporting. So this is a convention. This is a learned behavior. And why is it important in the art designs? Well, you can just expect to change something uh, in the habits of the players and expect them to get used to it. If you take, for example, a scroll bar and you change the way a scroll bar works, um, people won't get used to it. There is a little chance that it might work, but there are higher chances that the design will fail. So the thing is, 
we must bear in mind that we can't go against conventions most of the time. And why affordances? Well, let's say you want to make an object in the virtual wood uh, that you want the players to touch. So how do you design the object to afford uh, being touched? How do you make the objects um, appear that, um, affordable to touch? And how do you make the player want to touch it? How do you make the objects intuitive enough so that the player knows that when he touches it, it will trigger uh, this kind of action? Well, this is called affordances. And this is basically how well an object reflects its use. So let's take an example of this in VR. Uh, maybe some of you have already tried the lab from Valve. And here you can see a real user uh, who is trying the archery activity. And in this uh, activity, there are some objects you can interact with. There is the bow and arrow. And it feels very natural because you know these objects. It mimics the real world rules. You know that with your controller, you just have to grab it. And if you take a look at how uh, this user's is trying to interact with objects. It's, it's just like in the real world, you, you do this, and the controller vibrates, and you know that you can shoot your arrow. So it feels very intuitive. The player knew exactly, right from the beginning, how to inter interact with the object, and what action it will trigger. So, Conventions is part of learning processes, and affordances relates to visual attentions, and all of these are part of the cognitive process. What I'm aiming at in this introduction is that whatever the choices of a team you are working with, you are here to offer your support in the design they want to choose. But what is very important for us is to aim for intuitiveness. If you make intuitive design, it's a win for uh, VR and for user research. Why intuitiveness matters so much. I want to highlight this with a study case of eagle flight. And in eagle flight, you're an eagle and you can fly over Paris. And there are multiple activities that you can do. And to um, play this game, there are two main navigation controls. The first one is that you can turn your head left and right, like this, left or right and your eagle will just turn left or right. But there is another control that I will show you here. Here, the, the participant is learning to tilt. And if you take a close attention of how it does this, it's just lean his head like this, right and left. And it's very easy and comfortable, and the eagle will turn like this. So the point of this tilting uh, control is that if you lean your head like this, you can make a U-turn and it's very easy to perform. Now, let's take a look at this gentleman here. And this gentleman is not using the tilt, so let's see what happens when he does this. Attention. So pay, pay attention to his movement. Oh, c'est le So, of course, this was worrying. The, the development team came to us like, oh my gosh, what is happening here? Why are the players doing this? They're supposed to use the tilt, and the tilt is so much comfortable. So why are they doing this? So they had a lot of hypotheses. One of them was um, maybe there is something with uh, the woods, um, because we were testing it in Paris and they sent the, the build in English, so maybe this was a comprehension problem, so they sent us a build with a translated tutorial. And they were uh, asking themselves, okay, maybe this is a problem with the tutorial, there is something wrong with the learning. Uh, we scheduled usability interviews, we iterated, and we came to the conclusion that this was 
very uh, more complicated than this. Um, let me ask you a simple question. When in your everyday life do you tilt your head? Can you think of any activity that you do in your everyday life and you tilt your head? <laughs> yes. Listening? Yeah, but if someone calls your name and wants to have a conversation with you, uh, you are most likely to turn uh, to a person. And this is something that you have learned from the early beginning of your life. When someone calls your name uh, in the street, you will turn your head. And this is uh, the problem here. Although it was indeed more comfortable and that it decreased the difficulty in the activities, although you know this, you are in a fast-paced game and well, let's imagine you're in a multiplayer game and you have the prey and there are uh, mean eagles that are chasing you and they want to shoot at you and you have like one second to decide, should I go left, should I, should I go right, up, down? Of course, in this situation, you will aim for what is most intuitive. You will aim for, ter for tilting your head and not to, you will, sorry, <laughs> I got confused. You will, um, you will turn your head, you will not tilt your head, and this is called an automatism. So this is why uh, intuitiveness matters so much. So the problem was that the tail control was underused because of this, and it increased difficulty, comfort, and cyber sickness as well, because if you do uh, the kind of movement that this gentleman does, like 20 minutes, you will likely feel disoriented. But the story has a happy ending. Uh, we iterated on this and we came with two solutions. Okay, <laughs> uh, the first one is that um, you can attune the steel sensitivity to your liking, so it increases comfort because uh, this, um, these parameters are very easy and quick to access and people realize that it was uh, very important to use the tears and they could uh, make the sensitivity better. And to reinforce the learning process, we made a reminder, and every time the player had his head turned a 90 degree, uh, we expected that uh, the player wanted to do a U-turn just like this gentleman, there is a reminder that I saw player invites him to do the tilt instead. And players um, told us during the interviews that this was something that was very helpful to, uh, to learn the control over time. So the main takeaways here would be uh, cognitive process uh, matters a lot when you are working in the air. Um, intuitiveness also, and I think uh, we just see that, and cyber sickness and comfort can be hindered. So let's talk a bit about cyber sickness. I will show you very quickly uh, um, the common theory and we'll talk more about how to profile people, how to monitor cyber sickness during VR tests, and I will show you uh, a few best practices. So there are many theories on cyber sickness and my point is not to debate on this. Uh, I would just try to explain the things simply. Uh, so far we can, uh, we can assume that cyber sickness is like your eyes perceive the movements but it's not synchronized with your sensory systems and your body is motionless so it triggers an incoherency with your brain. So this leads to symptoms such as nausea, uh, visual tiredness, disorientations, could lead also to headaches. And this uh, can happen right now, just after you put off the headgear, but uh, after uh, the latest, hours after, uh, it can happen too. So there are a few things, well, there are many things that can hinder uh, cyber sickness. Uh, we talk a lot about technical settings, so just uh, to let you know if you don't. Uh, always run the game at 60 FPS at least, uh, 90 is it all. Uh, you shouldn't have over uh, 20 milliseconds of latency and uh, avoid frame rate drops at all costs. I would recommend to use um, FPS monitoring tool during your test so that you can check this. And game design can also hinder cyber sickness and this is very important because this is our role to pinpoint what in the design can lead the players to be sick. 
So there are a uh, lot of different examples. I just took a few examples based on the works of Philippe Fouche. Um, so uh, let's take, for example, if you want to design a game with a virtual hand and your body is motionless, your eyes will perceive a movement of a hand uh, which is not yours and it can trigger cyber sickness symptoms. If you do a game with a third person avatar, uh, it's the same, it's not a natural vision, you never look at yourself from a uh, third person. So this can also lead to uh, discomfort and cyber sickness. And the most well-known example is that uh, not having control on camera can be uh, very nauseous for you. So maybe you saw this talk of Kimberly Vole at JDC this year, and she said something that I think is very important. She said that we don't, like, we don't want players to start saying, I don't like VR because it makes me sick. Maybe some of you uh, read all the articles of the bad buzz on Resident Evil 7 in VR at E3. Maybe you heard of that. Uh, you don't want this to happen to the team you are working with. It's very important because it is our responsibility to avoid this. If people uh, at the beginning of VR have a real bad experience with a VR game, they will just expect all VR games to lead to that kind of experience. So this is very dangerous and this is very concerning for us. So if I still need to convince you that cyber sickness is a thing, this is what one of our users told us after um, um, half a day of playtest. He said, I needed time to get used to the sensation and at the end I felt as if I spent the day in an amusement park, rather shaken. So you could say, okay, well, if people um, don't, uh, if people are getting sick, they just drop the game and it's okay, but uh, that's not what is happening actually. So this is another user and he said, I would have never played so long if it wasn't so captivating. So users are, tend to not stop by themselves. Oculus um, guidelines uh, tells us, okay, you should take a break after 30 minutes of gameplay. Spoiler alert, uh, it never happens. If you are <laughs> immersed in a game, uh, you, especially in VR, you just, you don't have a watch and if you are having a lot of fun, you will play more than 30 minutes, so this is a problem. And people uh, don't realize that they can be sick. So this is what another user who said, it's just a headgear and it can't hurt you anyway. They don't realize it, even if they are sick, they just want to keep playing. So um, there is some guidelines we must follow uh, when we want to run the artist. Uh, this is uh, Oculus guidelines, and if you want to um, recruit for the artist, you must avoid other people who have health problems, and you must make sure that these people can see uh, 3D and have a good vision to avoid any biases. So, to profile users, we are using the motion history sickness questionnaire, um, and this questionnaire enables us to um, profile the participant in three different categories. So there are the very sensitive people, sensitive people, and the non-sensitive people. And if you take a look at this graphic, if you, if you want to deny cyber sickness, you're denying more than 50% of the players. The thing is, even people that are, we, who are non-sensitive to motion sickness can be sick in VR. So, using this questionnaire, you, we wanted to see if in playtest uh, it could be uh, significant, and this is what we, um, we came up with. So, we see that during our sessions, um, people that we categorize as non-sensitive, uh, there are only 4% of these people who had to stop the session because they were sick compared to 21% of the sensitive people. So in play test, uh, it was significant enough to be used. So if you're running VR test, you must recognize uh, the cyber sickness symptoms. You must know when to stop a participant, when a participant is sick. So there are a um, sample of behaviors that you can um, easily um, easily uh, perceive. Let's take a look at this uh, lady. 
So you see she will um, do something with her mouth. I don't know if you can see this. And she has this heavy breathing. Sometimes people are also replacing their chair. And if you look at what she does in the game, she flies at the lowest pace and she almost does nothing. So if you have a player who has this kind of behavior, you must stop him right away. Uh, we did this with her. She didn't stop by herself, but she said, I'm feeling too sick to um, keep on playing, and she had to leave the session. So you don't want this to happen. You need a solution that um, can enable you to um, prevent this situation, stop the players before they get too sick. So we're using the... Sorry. <coughs> We're using the simulator sickness questionnaire. And as you can see in the right, it's a very short questionnaire, very easy to schedule. So there are three dim dimensions here. Uh, the first dimension is nausea, and it is basically linked to some things as um, sweating, salivation increasing. You have the second dimension, uh, which is oculomotor fatigue, which is linked to uh, fatigue, headaches. And the third one is disorientation, and it's linked to fullness of the head, dizziness. So with this, um, you can pinpoint um, moments or uh, design in the game that can make people sick, and you can also uh, use this questionnaire to stop players before they get too sick. So how does it work? First, you make a baseline, and using this baseline, uh, you have um, um, the baseline measure of your participant, because participants can have a busy life, uh, they can uh, party all night and arrive in your playtest feeling already nauseous or um, tired, so you need this baseline. And then, um, if you have hypothesis like, okay, in my game, uh, I think that the design used in activity number six uh, might trigger some cyber sickness symptoms, uh, you can make a SSQ just before and just after and see if uh, symptoms uh, increased. Uh, this is something that we did uh, for our games and sometimes it, uh, it works. And using this, you can also um, build your database and compare uh, your games in terms of cyber sickness. So, I want to share with you some guidelines to, uh, to be ready for your VR test. Uh, one thing that I would recommend is to schedule short sessions. Don't do a uh, whole day, whole days of playtest. Uh, schedule uh, at least uh, at more. Uh, after day of session, and always think of a worst case scenario. Because if you provide the participants and you are inviting like uh, more sensitive and very sensitive participants that you can handle, uh, think that they, can, they might uh, get sick all in the same time, and you must uh, be ready to handle this. So, uh, always think of this. And well, it happens uh, if a participant gets sick, how do you react? So these are a few guidelines, and one of the most important is that if your participant is sick and he still is immersed in virtual reality, uh, just don't take off the headgear uh, without telling what you're doing, because this can be very scary. So Kimball Level said that um, we don't want players to start saying that I don't like VR because it makes me sick, but I think we don't want them to say this either. I don't like VR because it is painful. Well, cyber sickness and comfort of play are uh, related. And in terms of physical movement, uh, we saw this with the gentleman in a golf flight. Uh, but in other games, it can uh, also have some problems in terms of physical movements. This is what the user reported. He said, my ass hurt, my head feels heavy, and my neck is painful. Uh, these are strong words. So how do, we, how do we pinpoint what in the physical movement can be um, problematic? How do we avoid uh, players to be hurt in VR? So we can use physical ergonomics. And what physical ergonomics tells us is that we should um, adapt the device to the physical movements uh, we want to. 
uh, induced in the player. So we need to avoid things like uncomfortable movements, sustain over time, uh, turn on yourself, um, sudden physical movement and uncomfortable physical postures. Let's see uh, this demo uh, of NX Racket. I think this is a good example of what we need to avoid. So if you take a closer look to this lady uh, wide sudden movement, and if you see like this, and physical posture which are uh, <laughs> quite uncomfortable, and the thing she does like this, uh, she could have tripped on the wire, stumble on the wire, uh, and if you do this like more than 20 minutes, uh, I think you will uh, likely feel disoriented, disoriented. So we must uh, pinpoint all these uh, physical movements which can be problematic. So takeaways for uh, this part is that we need a solution to provide the users. Uh, we also need to monitor cyber sickness during the test to avoid any uh, problems and pinpoint physical movements that can uh, trigger issues. So I will end this presentation sh by sharing best practices with you. These best practices are based on our experiences so far and these are more like tips or tricks to help you build on top of this and adapt to uh, your need in playtest. So first of all, uh, I think the main difference between a VR test and a non-VR test is time. And time is really the key for you. First, you need uh, more time in training because all the people who are working with you on uh, moderating the playtest uh, should be trained in at least uh, cyber sickness. Uh, this makes sense. Uh, physical ergonomics too and uh, how to handle the devices. You also need much more time for the setup, uh, especially if you work with uh, Oculus Rift. You also need more time to um, test the build because uh, you're not superheroes. You can be sick too. Um, so, of course, uh, you should take a lot of breaks. You cannot test the build a whole day or you, you will likely get sick. So you need much more time to test your build. And passation too, because most of the players have not really uh, tried VR yet. So you need to explain them how it will, uh, how it will be like, what movements they can or cannot do uh, in the game you are testing. You must introduce them to uh, all of this, schedule a lot of more breaks, and uh, cyber sickness can occur. So uh, this, uh, this takes a lot of time if your participants uh, are sick. So VR um, requires special arrangements as well. You need to avoid all kind of collisions uh, between the desks, the chairs, the walls, but the users too, it can happen. Uh, it, it happened to us uh, in our first VR test with We Wolves Within because we had um, a special control in which you can lean on the side and it will trigger a private chat, a whisper chat. And of course we didn't realize that people could uh, lean in the same uh, side and people collided and so you don't want this to happen. So just uh, think of all the controls possible in the VR game and I will avoid this. Uh, you need to avoid uh, occluding the motion trackers. Um, you need us to, uh, to take care that the um, people don't stumble on the wires, especially with rush to survive devices. You need us to uh, safe space to put the headgear and mo moreover, um, this is very important, avoid rotating just because it can increase cyber sickness symptoms because it moves. So this is more like uh, personal advice uh, based on personal experience. Uh, if you're working on Oculus Rift, uh, you must know that uh, some SDK are not available on Oculus website. Uh, there are special SDK for developers. And if you don't communicate this with your team uh, right away, uh, this will be chaos. Um, because you take a lot of time to install SDK and your devices, and if it's the wrong SDK, you must uninstall this and reinstall uh, the new SDK, and it takes really, really a lot of time. 
uh, how to interact with someone using VR. So don't speak to them directly because uh, most of the time they won't hear you. Uh, never tap their shoulders. If you want to see how scary this is, uh, do this with your colleagues uh, and you will have the answer, but don't do this to uh, the players. Use a solution like Skype or Mumble. Uh, this is more discreet, especially if you want to ask a player that you suspect is sick to take a break. And it is very good solution for Finkelad as well. Um, Finkelad uh, is a method uh, that maybe you use in classical um, test, and it works well in um, VR. Maybe this is counterintuitive, but I wanted to say that it works well. And there are uh, things that you can do uh, to lack uh, electrical demo activity and eye tracking as well. There are special uh, devices in eye tracking that you can use for VR. And well, this is the beginning uh, of VR for uh, video game industry. So let's be creative, let's invent new methods. So to end this presentation, I want to share uh, one method. Uh, okay. <laughs> ah, it's too secret, I can show it. See what happened. Uh, it will take too long. Okay, <laughs> it works. Um, all right, let's talk a bit about how to observe social VR. So this is um, kind of fashion word this day, social VR. Uh, maybe you, sh you saw all these uh, amazing demos, uh, POS VR demo, um, Facebook demos. <laughs> well, we had uh, a game at Ubisoft, which is called We Were Sweden, maybe you know the board game. Um, so in this game, you play a villager, you, pl you all play villagers, and there is a wolf among you. And the purpose of the game, the goal of the game, is to discover who is the wolf hiding among you. And the social part is that you will all debate um, before voting against the person you think is a wolf. So, here in this video, people are just uh, chatting and trying to debate on who they think are real reliable or who they think might be the wolf. And this is a thing that occurred a lot of time when observing social VR. At some point, people just stop and they're all laughing. They're all laughing and you, you're just standing here and it's at, as an outside observer. And you're like, okay, why are they laughing? Is it good? Is it bad? I don't get it. You are missing something because you are not part of the group and you are missing the group's dynamic. So how can we um, get uh, an insight on this group's dynamic. We came with a solution that I want to uh, name the Confederate method. So if you know a bit about experimental psychology, a Confederate is a researcher who is pretending to be a participant. And this is exactly what we've done. We uh, had a game user researcher hiding like a wolf uh, among the participants. And with this technique, we had him emerge in the group and he had a better understanding of the group's dynamic. It, he was part of this. So of course you need ob outside observers, but you have this wolf among them and he gives uh, additional insights, additional uh, data. So this was very valuable for us. But uh, bear in mind that this is a demanding method and uh, ideally you need someone trained in psychology to avoid uh, any kind of bias with uh, interacting with the participants. So uh, I'm giving this to you. Uh, if you find the method um, interesting, just try it, and I would be very interested by your insight on this. So the takeaways to end this is that the artists require more time. Uh, you need to adapt space, you need to adapt tools to VR testing, and please be creative. It's uh, a good time for this. So thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer you.
Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Roy. I have a quick question about the Confederate method. Is that something you have to disclose to participants up front? Because um, I think with like the M MRS in the UK and CASRO in the States, there's some clause about like not deceiving participants, or I don't know how it works. Um, I didn't get the end of your... Oh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if, if there's any issues with, particularly with human subjects, about deception and leading respondents um, with the Confederate method? Well, like I said, um, this is the main issue. You need someone uh, who is uh, able to be, uh, to avoid any bias while interacting with, uh, with the participants. So um, you must adapt your speech to a participant. So they ask you questions, they're uh, integrating you in the group's dynamic. You must always bear in mind that uh, if you say something, you might reveal uh, hints or things that you want to uh, observe, uh, especially if you are uh, doing usability testing. So uh, this method is better for usability st testing, and you must always think of what you will give as an answer. Uh, this is something I like to say that uh, you are deceiving the participants, but at the end of the test, it is very important to uh, explain to a participant that you had this person, and, they, and this person uh, just played a role, but this was all for testing, and uh, no harm's done, and everyone is happy. Yeah. And uh, just one more question, sorry. Um, when you're recruiting participants for your VR testing, are you controlling for like level of experience with past VR usage as well? I was wondering how that might factor in. Do you mean for the person who plays the role? Or? If they've uh, played VR previously or are, mm. you know, are a hardcore VR player. I don't know anyone who is, but yeah. um, whether or not that on, is factoring into someone's cyber sickness. Yeah, it depends on the game you are working with and it uh, also depends on what kind of profile the developers uh, want to have. So, of course, uh, this is something that you uh, can control. And uh, this is something that we have done. Uh, for example, in one game, uh, the developers' teams wanted to avoid any bias of um, players not knowing how to use a controller with Vive. So we had to, uh, we had to hunt for uh, people who already bought a Vive, and this was uh, kind of uh, difficult because not everyone has a Vive. Uh, so, yeah, you can control this and invite specific uh, profile participants and make sure that uh, this participant have, um, like, uh, they bought a vibe or they had more like uh, 40 minutes. Uh, or you can schedule, um, like, uh, 10 or 20 minutes of uh, training so that people get used to the controls and then it can be, um, it can be in this way. Okay. Hello, Laura. Over here. here. <laughs> Thank you for a great talk. Um, it's really a new plunge into VR. So after having done a few studies, I really appreciate the detail and all the tips and practical ideas you just gave me. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, two questions actually related to the practical part of, of VR. And one is about uh, asking questions uh, and, and having that interaction with the user, um, we've noticed that when you put on the headset and remove it again, that action of kind of going between two worlds is in itself a bit of a stressful moment. Mm -hmm. so, so I saw that you have a lot of incremental uh, measures throughout yeah. the experience. How do you handle this transition back B back and forth into the VR. I see the point. Yeah, uh, this was something that we discussed with uh, one of our uh, development team. And the thing is that uh, it all depends on what you want to test. If you are on full usability testing uh, so far, um, just if you want to schedule this questionnaire, like uh, just after a specific activity or like uh, every 10 minutes, uh, this is, uh, it, it didn't um, lead to any problem with the participants. And in fact, it even gave them the opportunity to take a small break. And this was better for testing VR because uh, VR is very tiresome. So there was no problem with this. But if you make an appreciation test, this can be uh, a bit more tricky. 
and then uh, it's all up to you to make your protocol to avoid uh, any um, any bias uh, with the appreciation data that you want to retrieve. So it's up to you to schedule this test at the moments you see uh, fit as an expert. So uh, a second question related then to to the adaptation process and. Um, and especially novelty effect of VR, uh, I find experiential questions like how they find the experience in terms of how engaging and gratifying it is, it's really hard to pull out the, any data on what's being designed because just the experience of going into VR is so profoundly different. Uh, do you have any input on that? Yeah. Um, especially because uh, people are testing it for the first time, so uh, most of the time uh, the first data you will retrieve is the wow effect. So people uh, are very excited, saying, oh, wow, this is VR, this is incredible, uh, everything is incredible because this is VR and these are not the data you wanted. So um, there is a, a thing, there is two solutions that I can um, think of. Uh, the first one is recruit people that have already tested VR. Uh, this, is, this might be difficult, but well, uh, at least uh, you can um, avoid this war effect. Or um, you can also brief your participants and try to tell them that, okay, um, this is a new technology. I know you might be excited about this, but we really need you to focus on this part uh, if you will this of kind. Uh, so this is... <laughs> the two solutions that I can uh, think of right now. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, at the beginning you were talking a lot about new um, interaction techniques like tilting and um, the teleportation um, method that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, and so people actually have to learn using that while they are trying it out. Um, in your experience, how long does it take them to learn it? And do people vary strongly? Because I would imagine, especially when you're using your body, there may be differences. Yeah, actually, uh, it doesn't take uh, much time. Uh, I personally uh, played a survive uh, the lab that, that was my first activity and I just had one developer to explain me all the teleportation works and I just had to um, do it one time and then this is something that you learned and you will remember this. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you can see with um, most of the players. Uh, I think for um, non-self-explicit -ex controls, uh, tutorials should just work fine. Uh, based on the principle that it do, don't go against any conventions or habits. Um, tutorials uh, just work fine and then uh, you learn uh, the behavior and it's pretty quick. So for teleportation it just works fine and this is something that once you learn uh, doing in one game you will just uh, know how it works on, in, other, in another game and so it's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. That's all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you.